Good morning. Good morning. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I have a story for you. What a surprise. There once was a colonel in the army stationed just behind the front lines in the headquarters. It was his job to get the information from the generals, make sense of it, in charge of the staff, his officers, all those other people, really the brains just behind the front lines. But it was said of him that he was mean. And sometimes he did some really strange things. You see, his secretary would come in every morning and offer him a cup of coffee. He would very sharply dismiss her. No, get back to work. No explanation. He barely left the headquarters unless it was really dark in the morning or dark at night. And if he did leave, he'd put on this old rag of an overcoat. And even though there was nothing wrong with him, he'd grab a pair of crutches and just hobble around outside. And when he was out there, no one would salute him. So his staff thought, nobody respects this colonel. He's no good. When the courier came in to get the battle plans and all the stuff to bring it to his officers on the front line, he often had questions. Inquisitive fellow. He would dismiss him too. Shut up, get out of here and get to the front line. Get the reports out there. One day, his staff found out that he'd been promoted. Brigadier general, that's a one-star general. Pretty good. How did that happen? Nobody likes him. Well, they were glad to see him gone. His replacement came in. New guy, a little bit younger. Maybe a little arrogant. He sat down at the desk, and he noticed on the desk was like a composition notebook. Remember those? The black and white ones? I'm probably dating myself now. <laughs> it said instructions on it. Well, <laughs> I don't need those. Open up the bottom drawer, throw them in there, close the drawer. Secretary comes in. Want a cup of coffee, sir? Oh, yes. I'd love to be served a cup of coffee. So she goes. About an hour goes by, he gets curious, what happened to her? So he heads out to the mess hall to find out what's going on. On his way out, he noticed nobody is saluting him. So he gets mad, he reprimands some of the soldiers. Hey, stand at attention when you see me, salute me, I'm an officer. Just then, crack, bullet whizzes right past his arm, right through his uniform. He ducks for cover, runs in the headquarters. Are you okay, sir? No blood. Lucked out, just went through his uniform. Secretary comes in shortly thereafter with a cold cup of coffee now and some of the reports that he has to analyze. So he's a little bit distracted because he almost got killed. He does his best to finish the reports. Courier comes in, starts asking questions. Well, he's happy to share with him all that he knows because he knows a lot. Sends him out to the front lines. Then he gets to thinking, you know what? Maybe I'll head out there on the front lines. I hear the press is out there today. I'll get my picture taken. And I'll show everybody I'm not like my predecessor. I'm a guy who leads from the front. So he heads out. On the way there, he stops at the aid station about halfway there. This is where the nurses are taking care of those who are wounded. He notices it's totally full. What's going on? Where's the press? They took off. It's going south. This place has never been so full. So he heads to the front line, checks with his officers. What's going on? Chaos. We're losing the battle. Well, didn't you get my battle plans? They came a little late. And so chaos ensued. And then when I did read them, I really couldn't make heads or tails of it. You know, all due respect, sir, you sound like you're distracted. Just then, sound of a mortar coming in landed right in front of them, kills the colonel and his officers. Well, they managed to hold their ground and do okay. A new colonel comes in, sits down at the desk of the headquarters his first day. He's a little more inquisitive. He looks around the desk, he opens up the bottom drawer, pulls out the instructions. Might want to read these. He opens them up. Been here a while. I'm experienced. You could take it or leave it, this advice. First things first, your secretary, she's going to come in and offer you a cup of coffee. Truth be told, she doesn't care about you or the coffee. 
She just wants to go to the, to the mess hall to flirt with one of the cooks she likes there. She's going to get you the reports late. That's going to be a problem. Wouldn't leave the headquarters. But if you do, put on that overcoat I left for you and grab the crutches. You see, there's a sniper out there. And he's not going to take a shot revealing his position at a wounded private. But he finds out you're an officer, he'll take the shot. So whatever you do, don't let anybody salute you. Then the courier is going to come in. He's going to ask a lot of questions. Truth about him, he's a gossip. He's also a flirt. He's going to flirt with the nurses at the aid station. Then the reports are going to come in late. Chaos will ensue. And whatever you do, don't be a show-off and talk to the press at the front lines. Tell them get you killed. There's only one of you and thousands of them. You see, it doesn't matter what people think of you. A leader's job is to keep the men alive. And they'll thank you for it later. That is, if you're around to thank. You see, there is something to be said for following very specific instructions, even if they seem strange. Today, we find ourselves in the rest of the story, where we'll see that God is very specific in his instructions, and sometimes they seem strange. We're continuing in the rest of the story. We arrive in 2 Samuel 5 and 6, and 1 Chronicles 11 through 16. So if you know the Old Testament well, you know what's happening here. They're running parallel, these accounts. If you don't, you're probably confused, so I'll help you. Most Christians know the New Testament a little bit better. And you might know that there's four gospel accounts, biographies of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And some of them are very similar, almost exact in certain areas, and then they get different here and there. Why? Different perspectives. There's no contradictions, just told from different angles. That's all. So that's what's happening here in the Old Testament. In 1 Chronicles, it's going to pick up right here, and it's going to move through, through 1 Kings, 2 Kings, as well into 2 Chronicles, all running parallel. But they have different perspectives. Some talk about things that the other accounts don't. So we're going to hop from 2 Samuel, where we were, into 1 Chronicles, because it's a more robust account. And I'm just going to overview some things, because we run into some stuff that gets a little bit long for a Sunday morning. Unless you want to stay here a while, we can do that. So where we left off, David, King David, is securing a divided kingdom after the death of Israel's first king, Saul, and then his son, Ishbosheth. Fun names to say. So we find ourselves in 1 Chronicles 11, starting at verse 1. Then all Israel gathered before David at Hebron and told him, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, even when Saul was king, you were the one who really led the forces of Israel. And the Lord your God told you, you will be the shepherd of my people Israel. You will be the leader of my people Israel. So here at Hebron, or there at Hebron, David made a covenant before the Lord with all the elders of Israel, and they anointed him king of Israel just as the Lord had promised through Samuel. So David is now going to establish his capital city, Jerusalem. It's not going to be called that right away. It's Jebus. And so here's where we're going to hop back to 2 Samuel a little bit because different things are said. So you've got to put it all together. Both things are said. It's just the author points out one and then the other. 2 Samuel 5 tells us that there's kind of like this taunt, an exchange. The people of Jebus, it's like a fortress and they're very confident in there. So they're like, even the lime and blind, blind and, blind and lame <laughs> could keep you out. And that was a tongue twister there. I'll try saying it again too. In 1 Chronicles, and David says, whoever's the first to get in there and kill one of those Jebusites, I'll make him my commander. So remember Joab? Kind of already the commander, but he's the first one to do it. Makes him the commander. He says, go in through a water tunnel. That's how they get in there. So Joab, he is David's sister's son, Zeruiah. They build up the city of David, makes it his home, and he becomes king. So if you're confused, 
city of David, Zion, Jerusalem, pretty much synonymous. Now we get some info in 1 Chronicles that isn't in 2 Samuel 5 through 6. I'll summarize for you. David's mighty warriors. This can get really confusing because you got to hop all the way over to 2 Samuel 23 <laughs> to get this information. So I'm trying to put it all in order, kind of, chronologically for you. So he has his top guys. Jashabim, he's the leader. It says that he kills 300 men, or in one of the other accounts, 800 men in one battle. Laser, second guy. And if we hop over to 2 Samuel 23, Shama. So they're the head guys. Then we get a list of these 30 mighty warriors. And just before we do, we get some exploits in there. There's a story about the Philistines taking over in Bethlehem, and David remarks, he's from there, oh, how I love some of that water in Bethlehem from the well by the gate. So the three mighty men, they kind of scout it out, they go behind Philistine lines, they get them the water, they bring back the water, and what does he do? He pours it out. This water, is as precious as the blood of the men who brought it to me. So he pours it out like an offering to the Lord. Now you have the 30 mighty men. And if we turn the page, we continue to 1 Chronicles 12. It now recalls things that happened at Ziklag. So it's not always chronological. It'll think backwards. And all these men are joining him, we now find out. They're defecting to David during the time of Saul. People from the tribe of Benjamin, they can... Sling a stone with their left hand as good as their right should remind you of Judges chapter 20, if you've been with us this whole time. Then it lists people who joined him while he was at Hebron. So it's going through chronologically. There's a huge celebration. And again, they confirm David as king over Israel. This happens a lot. He gets confirmed quite a bit. So now they're ready to move the ark to Jerusalem. Where was the ark? It's at Kiriath Jerum. So do you remember? They lost to the Philistines. The Philistines stole the ark, caused them trouble. They send the ark back. But some unfortunate fellows look into it at Beth Shemesh. It kills them. And they tell the people from Kiriath Jerum, take the ark. We don't want it. It stays there for 20 years. David says, it's been neglected during the time of Saul. So they're going to bring it back. We turn the page. First Chronicles 13.1. David consulted with all his officials, including the generals and captains of his army. Then he addressed the entire assembly of Israel as follows. If you approve, and if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send messages to all the Israelites throughout the land, including the priests and Levites in their towns and pasture lands. Let us invite them to come join us. It is time to bring back the ark of God, for we neglected it during the reign of Saul. The whole assembly agreed to this, for the people could see it was the right thing to do. So David summoned all Israel, from Shihor Brook of Egypt in the south, all the way to Lebo Hamath in the north, to join in bringing the Ark of God from Kiriath Jerim. So now they retrieve it from Abinadab's house there. And they do some things that should seem similar. They put it on a cart like the Philistines did. Uzzah and Ohio, these two guys are leading it. They're doing all right, dancing and celebrating around the ark until the oxen stumbles. Uzzah reaches out to grab the cart, touches the cart. God strikes him dead. We'll get to why in a little bit. David's angry. He names the place bursts out at Uzzah, Perez Uzzah. If you remember the name Perez, if you're paying attention in Genesis, where that comes from. Remember Judah and Tamar? Zerah sticks his hand out, they tie the scarlet thread around it, he pulls it back, and then Perez bursts out. It means burst out. It's an important name. It'll come up again. So here's what happened. First Chronicles 13, 12. David was now afraid of God, and he asked, how can I ever bring the ark of God back into my care? So David did not move the ark into the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom and Gath. The ark of God remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months, and the Lord blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he owned. And we turn the page, chapter 14, we see a communication between David and Hiram of Tyre. This will come up again. We talk about the cedars of Lebanon. Solomon will 
communicate with him later, David's son. Apparently, if you want good cedar wood, that's where you get it from. David builds his palace, marries more wives. It gives a list of his children, his sons born in Jerusalem. And then there's a different placement of the Philistine defeat. In 2 Samuel 5, it happened a little bit earlier. They hear that David is named king, and so they gather together all their forces. What's important about this account is David consults with the Lord. Should I go out to fight them? Yes. So he has success, burns all their idols. They come back, David again. Should I go out and fight them? Yes. And he gives them a signal and a sign, very specific instructions. Don't Go straight on, circle around a battle plan to the poplar trees, and then when you hear sound like feet marching on the tops of the trees, then attack. He follows the instructions. God gives him the victory. Now, if we turn the page, 2 Samuel 6 will tell us that David finds out that the household of Obed-Edom is blessed. So, he takes this as confirmation. Go back to 1 Chronicles 15, starting at 1. David now built several buildings for himself in the city of David. He also prepared a place for the ark of God and set up a special tent for it. Then he commanded, no one except the Levites may carry the ark of God. The Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of the Lord and serve him forever. Now they want to give it another try, but this time they do it right. If he had followed the instructions the first time, Numbers 4, he would have known that the Levites were the only ones who were supposed to carry it. So now they do it. Gives us a list of all the people that he chooses. They purify themselves. They prepare themselves for this very important thing, following the instructions. We get a whole list, along with musicians, everything. First Chronicles 15, 25, then David and the elders of Israel and the generals of the army went to the house of Obed-Edom to bring the ark of the Lord's covenant up to Jerusalem with great celebration. And because God was clearly helping the Levites as they carried the ark of the Lord's covenant, they sacrificed seven bulls and seven rams. David was dressed in a robe of fine linen, as were all the Levites who carried the ark, and also the singers and Kenaniah, the choir leader. David was also wearing a priestly garment. So all Israel brought up the ark of the Lord's covenant with shouts of joy, the blowing of ram's horns and trumpets and the crashing of cymbals, and loud playing on harps and lyres. So this should remind you, remember the fall of Jericho in Joshua 6? It's very similar this type of procession. Something else you might remember. Michael. Saul's daughter, David's first wife. She was detained, if you remember, with Ishbosheth, his son, stayed there. Married another guy, even though they weren't divorced, named Palti. Remember, he was kind of pitiful, Palti, walking behind. Abner tells him, stop crying, go home. Well, it seems like she has an attitude problem, because here's what happens. First Chronicles 15, 29. But as the Ark of the Lord's Covenant entered the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked down from her window. When she saw King David skipping about and laughing with joy, she was filled with contempt for him. Maybe she's jealous. You see, David seemed a little crazy to her, skipping around. But he's worshiping the Lord. You mustn't criticize people in their worship. Sometimes it looks crazy to us but she criticizes it. But there's something else. He's also a good godly leader. For all his faults, David does a few things right. He usually honors his commitments and oaths. We know he's a great warrior, a great general. People really respect him. A great king. But there's something more important than that. The biggest one. David is a prayer warrior. David gives us about half of the Psalms. He's a prayer warrior. He usually, almost always, consults with God before he does anything. Like the Philistines. He made no assumptions. Should I go out and fight them? Yes, go out and fight them. He's already been given permission. They come back and he asks again. Most of us would assume, of course, well, he already gave, we do this, right? He already gave me permission, so I just assume that it's okay. No, he asks. He almost always consults with the Lord. Except 
that first time moving the ark. If you notice, he asked the congregation, not the Lord or the Levites the first time. Oh, you guys want to do this? Oh, by the way, we'll send messengers and invite those Levites. A little backwards. He puts it on a cart. That's how the Philistines sent it out. And that cart was chopped up and used for firewood. Shouldn't have done that. He should have consulted with Numbers 4. The king was supplied with the book of the law. He's supposed to read it a lot. It says that in Deuteronomy. Guess he didn't do that. The Levites should have been carrying it. And now Uzzah pays the price with his life. Later in 1 Chronicles, before they move it the second time, we get that big list of the Levites. Then 1 Chronicles 15, 12, he said to them, you are the leaders of the Levite families. You must purify yourselves and all your fellow Levites so you can bring the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place I prepared for it. Because you Levites did not carry the ark the first time, the anger of the Lord our God burst out against us. We failed to ask God how to move it properly. Instructions. Gets it right the second time. Because he listens to God. He follows the instructions. You see, a good leader consults with the Lord. A good leader listens to the Lord. You do that before you do anything. It doesn't matter how it looks to other people. Leaders must be in the word and in prayer. If someone isn't listening to the Lord, we shouldn't be listening to them. But if they are, if they're clearly washed in the word, if they're clearly following the instructions, then people should be careful before criticizing, especially if they're not in the word. So when leaders are in the word, even if what they're doing looks a little bit strange to us, we shouldn't make assumptions like we talked about last week or criticizing because we probably don't or maybe can't have full knowledge. A godly leader is equipped with information that we might not understand. It may seem crazy. We don't always have the information that we do. We see that Michael pays the price for criticizing. There's something we find in 2 Samuel that isn't in 1 Chronicles. Get a little bit more of the story. 2 Samuel 6.16, 6, But as the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked down from her window. When she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she was filled with contempt for him. That part's about the same. She has an attitude problem. But we see in 2 Samuel, she pays the price for it. 2 Samuel 6.20, When David returned home to bless his own family, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. She said in disgust, how distinguished the king of Israel looked today, shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vulgar person might do. David retorted to Michael, I was dancing before the Lord who chose me above your father and all his family. He appointed me as leader of Israel, the people of the Lord. So I celebrate before the Lord. Yes, and I'm willing to look even more foolish than this, even to be humiliated in my own eyes. But those servant girls you mentioned indeed will think I am distinguished. So Michael, the daughter of Saul, remained childless throughout her entire life. She has an attitude problem, and she pays the price for it. We shouldn't have an attitude problem, but we can't ask why. That's okay to do. We see it in the Psalms. Psalm 42.9. O oh God, my rock, I cry, why have you forgotten me? Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by my enemies? We can do so, asking God, asking leadership questions. It's okay, as long as we do so respectfully. And as long as we understand that, we might not get an answer. Just as a godly leader might not be able to share why, Confidentiality, timing. Do you know that a good leader tests his flock? 
Sometimes it's a test. Sometimes people fail <laughs> the test. You see, like coaches, we want you to exercise your faith. It's a good thing. Because God desires true faith. And sometimes, God chooses not to share. You see, if we're truly walking in faith, we shouldn't need to know everything, should we? Isn't that the point of faith when you think about it? Proverbs 20, 24. The Lord directs our steps. So why try to understand everything along the way? If the Lord is directing our steps, if we have faith. So being a good soldier for Christ means having faith. And faith means following instructions. Even if we don't know why. The instructions might not make sense to you. You might not understand why. But perhaps they will make sense later. And here's the other side of the why. Psalm 42, 11. Why am I so discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. We must trust the Lord. Now I get it, we struggle. We want to know the whys. We're curious, aren't we? Why? We must have faith. But why? Why is this happening? Why is that happening? So in a small way, in the church, little things, why is that being done this way? Or why is this being done that way? Kind of encouraging everybody to turn it around a little bit. At work, maybe you're in charge of certain things. And someone could very easily look at your job into what you're doing and start criticizing. Ever have that happen? They don't have anything to do with your job. They know nothing about what you do. But they got a lot to say about it, right? A lot. Do we do this? Do we watch the news? I was watching a general talking on the news and explaining some things. And it was so funny because the person interviewing him was not really interviewing him. He was arguing with him. <laughs> like, do you really want him to answer your questions or do you just want to start a fight? I think they just want to start a fight. This guy's a general in the army. And then you get all these people commenting on it, right? If you go online, there's like even more, like 17-year-old kids commenting. Do you really think you know what a general in the army knows? Really? They're behaving like it. There's a lot of arrogance out there. Well, but think about how that feels when someone does that in your job. Something that you went to school for, you studied really hard to get a degree. And people just come in, they just start telling you how to do your job. So it's like this in church. And even more magnified so much more greatly with God. If we shouldn't assume those things, we should never assume we know everything that God does or expect him to be able to explain why. I get it, especially now on a global level. Why? I've asked the question, don't worry, it's okay. The psalmist did it. Why, God? Why is all this going on? This mess. Doesn't it seem like a mess? Yes, it's a mess out there. A total mess. And so we ask, why? Why is this happening in the world? But don't feel bad if you've asked that question, because the disciples did too. You see, Jesus was crucified, died, buried, rose from the dead, and appeared to people, including his disciples. Acts 1.6. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. Look what Jesus says. They're not for you to know. Interesting. I've said this before. I'll remind you again. It's really important. There's one thing that all end times prophets have in common outside the Bible. The Bible, reliable. 
What does the Bible say? It's not for you to know. What do all these end times prophets with YouTube channels say? I know. Really? One thing they all have in common, they're all wrong. It's disobedient to what Jesus said. They're false prophets. They're liars. You can't, Jesus says, you can't know. Disciples have been told this already. Mark 13, Matthew 24. The angels don't know. The son doesn't know. Jesus. Only the father knows when all this is going to happen. Don't listen to the false prophets. If Jesus doesn't know, we can't know. These people lack faith. That's what Jesus requires, faith. We must have faith and be faithful. Faithful also means following instructions. Jesus continues, Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. While we're waiting patiently in faith, we must faithfully be following instructions. This means proclaiming the glory of the Lord, being witnesses to Jesus, witnesses to the word, not the world. That's what we should be out there talking about. Hey, whatever. I don't put my hope in government. I don't put my hope in a president or a king. No, the one true king. That's where all my hope is. That's it. This world's always been a mess. Since Adam and Eve, since the fall, it's never been right. Read your Old Testament again. It's pretty bad. It's getting so bad, Pastor Gene. That's what people tell me. I'm like, you have not read your Bible. <laughs> what are we going to do? I get that a lot. You have not read your Bible. <laughs> what is the Lord going to do? That's the correct question. What is the Lord going to do? Well, it tells us. <laughs> He's coming back. He's going to straighten it out. All of our hope, all of our trust, all of our faith needs to be put in him, not any worldly establishment. Acts 1.9. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud, the ascension, while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday, someday, he'll return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Indeed, if we go to the only reliable prophecy that we have about the end times, it tells us some important things that we should keep our hope in while all this stuff is going on around us. And it is this, that Jesus will come back. Eyes, with flames of fire in them, sword coming out of his mouth, the judgment sword. He is going to straighten it all out. He's going to do the judgment. He is going to win the battle. This whole earth will be wiped away. I think Christians forget that. It's all going to be wiped away, gone. But for us, if you are in Jesus, if he is your king, you're going to get a new heavens, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. You're not even going to need the sun. That's gone too. God will be enough. He'll be our eternal light. This is what we're waiting for. Then it says this. The disciple Jesus loves, observes this. Revelation 21.3. Then I heard a shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. and There'll be no more death or sorrow, or crying, or pain. All these things are gone forever. We must put our trust in God's word, put our hope in God's word, our faith in God's word, and patiently wait, because in his promises, we find peace. After the ark arrived at Jerusalem, 
David gives Asaph. He's a guy you're going to hear about if you read a lot of the Psalms. He's a psalmist too. But he gives him a special song praise to sing. It's another example of scriptures running parallel. We see pieces of this. I'm not going to do the whole thing in Psalm 105, 106, 96. But today as we close, let's give God the glory. Let's praise him with this psalm. 1 Chronicles 16, 23. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations and on the internet. Tell everyone about the amazing things he does. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. The gods of the other nations are mere idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty surround him. Strength and joy fill his dwelling. O nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offerings and come into his presence. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. Let all the earth tremble before him. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Tell the nation the Lord reigns. Let the sea and everything in it shout his praise. Let the fields and their crops burst out with joy. Let the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Cry out, save us, O God of our salvation. Gather and rescue us from among the nations. We can thank your holy name and rejoice and praise you. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives from everlasting to everlasting. And all the people said, Amen. Amen.